Greetings, dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen. This is a dialogue, a program that deals with current issues unfolding in Ethiopia and on the continent of Africa. In this edition, we'll be talking about the continent of Africa, the success stories, the challenges, and the way forward. And I'm so honored to have on my show the great Pan-Africanist and great speaker, the distinguished son of Africa, Professor Lumumba will be talking about a host of issues when it comes to Africa with the program. I'm Shifar Aulako. Do stay with us. <music> Professor, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me just get right into it and let me ask you uh, this question first of all. Um, Sir, whenever we talk about the continent of Africa, there are two major narratives. On the one hand, we hear that Africa is growing, Africa is blossoming, burgeoning, and so there is this positive trajectory. On the other hand, some nations, especially those that are called the developed ones, say Africa is still developing, and no one knows when it will be fully developed or it will ever develop at all. And as such, it needs support, aid, and intervention, sir. And in the middle, we find this great continent, Africa, which is bearing the brunt of the positive and the negative, swaying from side to side. So what is the prospect of such a continent, Professor? First of all, let us appreciate that Africa does not define herself. Africa has allowed herself to be defined by others. So when you listen to some of these uh, descriptions and definitions of Africa, particularly through the Western media and Western institutions, they are very condescending descriptions of Africa as if Africa was some kind of baby to be nurtured, some kind of curiosity to be examined. And when you see that, and many of these institutions are known to us, the IMF, the World Bank, Moody's, Western media, they tend to be very negative about Africa. And in defining Africa, they define what development is using indices, particularly the GDP. Those are Afro-pessimists. Then there are those who, even if they are optimistic, they still look at Africa from a very negative and myopic standpoint, almost always describing Africa as if she were homogeneous. Africa is heterogeneous. Africa is a mosaic, currently divided into 54 countries with uh, very painful recent history, a history of colonization, a history of continuing neocolonization. And then there are those of us who hold the view that Africa could have done better, the disruptions notwithstanding, and that indeed when one looks at Africa today, the conflicts and other difficulties notwithstanding, one sees an Africa that continues to be the repository of many resources, including human resources. And it is that Africa that we want to talk about, an Africa which is still victimized by the diabolical forces of the West and increasingly other forces from China, Russia, Turkey, and even some Arab countries which are not so charitable to the African continent. Moving on from there, um... As you know, Professor, Africa has been busy providing solutions to its problems caused by itself or others. We also hear these uh, great ideals of you know, African solutions to African problems, uh, finding indigenous uh, solutions to the problem, which is really appreciable. So we're seeing a positive economic integration, such as the AFCFTA. Although this is encouraging, Sir, scholars argue that this is not enough and for Africa to be prosperous, really prosperous, the root causes must first be addressed. Prof, what's your say here? You know, 
Africa, once again, I've got to remind us that Africa is a continent in the first place and that we have 54 countries and these countries claim sovereignty and these countries have development plans and these development plans address their specific needs. But that notwithstanding, Mm. As early as the 1960s, African countries and African leaders, the positive ones, recognized that in order for Africa to realize our potential, there was need for collaboration and integration. And many of us will remember, for example, as early as the 1980s under the aegis of the Organization of African Unity then, the Lagos Plan of Action was designed to ensure that we improve intra-African trade. And it was predicated upon the realization that we must uh, remove tariff and non-tariff barriers, that we must allow people to move across the continent of Africa, and that we must move towards integration. And regionally, African countries have organized. The East African community, for example, which was the most uh, uh, loaded uh, system of uh, collaboration and integration was in existence until 1977 when it collapsed, but is now revived. ECOWAS in West Africa, SADAC, and of course institutions such as COMESA. So there have always been attempts to make Africa work as one unit. But those attempts have not always achieved the desired result. And when the Organization of African Unity transitioned in the year 1999 in certain Libya, ultimately leading to the African Union in Durban in the early 2000s, the whole idea was that under the aegis of the African Union, Africa could collaborate and work together a lot more. And we have seen many declarations in all yeah. sectors. If you go into the sector of aviation, we have the Yamasukru declaration, you have the Malabo declaration on agriculture, you have the Maputo declaration on the integration of women, you have the Abuja declaration on, 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 uh, on health, you have the declaration on, on free movement of persons, and now, 2013, we also have the Africa Agenda 2063, whose entire objective is to make Africa to be a continent that is competitive in the world from an Afrocentric standpoint, but yet sufficiently alive to the realities of the globe. And it is in that context that the Africa continental free trade area is now moving us into the direction of enhanced trade. And I think that that in itself is a statement that we have now diagnosed our problem. But let us not ever forget one thing, that European countries through institutions such as the European Union, former colonizers such as the United Kingdom through the Commonwealth, former French, uh, the French through the organization of French speaking countries, and through Western NGOs are never asleep. They want to continue to be present in Africa in order to control our activities and in order to ensure that we do not unite, in order to ensure that we do not coordinate our affairs internally. And therefore, those are some of the headwinds that many African countries face even as we move towards enhanced unity, towards enhanced trade, towards elimination of conflicts. It is never easy. It is a struggle that we must engage in. And we are under an obligation to constantly keep reminding some African leaders. Remember that within the ranks of African leaders, there are also fifth columnists who are used by external powers to torpedo what is in the interest of the continent of Africa? Mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Definitely. Um, talking about, Professor, talking about colonialism, Africa seems to be, or Africa is recovering from the brunt of colonialism, as many say. And uh, also, Africa has taken some time to secure its independence. However, 
On the other hand, it's still suffering from the spillover effects, uh, as you said, not to mention the fact that this continent is still the battleground of uh, foreign interests. Uh, so a new scramble for yeah. Africa, sir, seems to be rearing its ugly head in a new and devious fashion. And this time around from different corners, Professor. So why are African leaders seemingly failing to realize that Africans um, can achieve a lot together rather than still depending on other nations separately? What's the major stumbling block here, sir? You know, the problem that we have is one of the failure by a critical mass of African politicians that in order to immunize ourselves against the machinations of foreign powers, our safety lies in working together. Because if we don't, it is very easy to isolate individual leaders who appear to be moving in the right direction. And my understanding is that if we unite and work as a team, then it will become very difficult for foreign powers to manipulate us. Let us also remember that we cannot continuously and consistently just blame others. We must define our interests. And having defined our interests, we must move in the direction of fulfilling those interests. If we cannot, in the early stages, do so continentally, we can do so regionally. So that within the East African community, if we are collaborating or engaging the European Union or the Americans or the Turkish or the Qataris or the Russians, we define what is it that we want in agriculture? What is it that we want in technology now that we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution and the fifth industrial revolution? What is it that we want in mining? And if we do that consistently, it will be very difficult for these latter day neo colonizers to find a way of manipulating us. But the tragedy, if I may use the word tragedy, is that. The, uh, the latter-day colonizers are very good at isolating individual leaders and unleashing unto us individuals whose only claim to fame is that they appear to be friends, but they are fundamentally Trojan horses that are being used to gain entry into the continent of Africa. And that is why voices of reason must be consistent in order to remind the leadership and leadership particularly of the political kind that going forward, we must work as a team. And I'm beginning to see that. I'm beginning to see that in East Africa, that there is a consistent voice. I'm very happy, for example, that in Kenya, the administration has now said that any person of African origin will not require a visa to come into Kenya. If that could be the thing that we would do, then we would be talking about trade. And if we do that, even our militaries, because this world is still a jungle where survival is of the fittest and death is for the least suitable. Things such as having military bases in Djibouti, in, uh, in Sudan, in, uh, in Ghana, we should not allow these foreigners to have military bases, whether they are Americans, whether they are Russians, whether they are Qataris, whether they are Chinese, because as long as they are boots on our ground, they can always make sure that they beat us into smithereens if we don't play ball. So yeah. the mantra here is unity, coordinated action, making sure that Africa is not a source of raw materials. We must begin to manufacture things. Mm. We must begin to produce things for ourselves. We cannot be a continent which does not even assemble an aeroplane. We cannot be a continent which only 
imports cars. We cannot be a continent that only consumes mobile phones and television. We cannot be a continent which imports finished goods from Europe and America. We cannot be a continent that imports things from China and imports even military hardware from other parts of the world. We are 1.4 billion of us conservatively. And if we are united, there is no reason why we cannot achieve what the Koreans achieved after the Korean War in 1953, what the Singaporeans have done, what the Turkish have done, what the Chinese have done, that is the direction in which we should move. And the meetings of the African Union now should not be about further declaration. It is, should mm -hmm. be about implementing the declaration that we have already made. Because as it is, we have so many declarations in all critical areas that we can no longer afford the luxury of manufacturing others and not doing anything about it. So we must move in critical areas. Look at artificial intelligence. Look at mobile telephony. We are consumers of things that are made by Western countries and Western companies, which means we can be switched off the international communication system if we don't very quickly and dedicatedly begin to do things for ourselves. The opportunities are there. We must exploit them. We must speak about them. And the media, even the media, we don't yeah. control the media. And if you don't control the media, it means you are defined by others. You consume news, which is packaged for you. I call it uh, Coca-Cola, uh, Ken Chick, uh, fried chicken kind of news. Even democracy is defined for you. Mm. So these are the things that we must deal with. Wow, wow, impressive, impressive idea, Prof. Um, Africa is rich with natural resources, and this is becoming a mixed blessing, you know, because the continent is grappling with interferences, machinations, and plots to usurp the wealth Africa possesses. This continent is also being saddled with seemingly never-ending debts, bro. So I want to ask you this question as well. Does Africa have no other options than this situation that it is in right now, bro? <laughs> no, let me first of all tell you that we are in many ways allowing uh, the unpalatable to happen to us. Look at the debt situation that yeah. we keep on talking about. You and me know that the DNA of the Bretton Woods institutions, which has kept us in perpetual debt, is to keep us in perpetual debt. The Zambian economist Dambisa Moyo has written a good book, which I commend to all of us, called Dead Aid. The South Korean Ha Jun Chang has also written a beautiful book called The Bad Samaritan. And my own view is that we must find a way of getting ourselves out of this debt trap. I remember in 1987 when Tomar Sisidok Sankara was the president of Burkina Faso. He delivered a speech in Addis Ababa on the occasion of a meeting of the heads of states and government saying we must release ourselves from this debt trap. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Because look at the kind of money that countries borrow from the IMF. Three billion dollars. Do you know the African individuals who can actually lend three billion dollars? Do you know that African politicians have stolen enough money and kept it in Europe and in Switzerland and in other parts of the country that if that money were returned to the continent of Africa, we would pay all the debts that we owe? Do you know that we have enough resources which we, if we added value to would in fact be sufficient to release us from the debt? So one of the things that I think that Africa should do co collectively is to make a vow that in the next 10 years, Africa is not going to borrow from any of these Bretton Woods institutions. And even in terms of bilateral debts, we, bet debts, we are going to relieve ourselves. And that calls into question the role of initially conceived African institutions like the African Development Bank. The African Development Bank now has about 88 shareholders. And some of the biggest shareholders are actually foreign countries. The second largest shareholder in African Development Bank now is the United States of America. 
we should move to buy off all those shares so that African Development Bank becomes a true pan-African bank. If we want to lend, we, we want to borrow, we borrow from them. And if we want to collaborate with the Asian Development Bank or any other banks, we do so from a position of strength. In a nutshell, I'm saying, as long as we allow ourselves to be saddled with that, those debts will never grow. Remember, a borrower is a slave of the lender. Wow. That's the message. Also, Prof, whenever we talk about African unity and solidarity, the idea of pan-Africanism comes to the fore. This ideology has been going on for quite some time now. Uh, in this connection, what has the AU achieved so far and what remains to be done? You know, there is the tendency sometimes to judge ourselves very harshly. Let us ask ourselves in 1963 when the OAU was founded. Of course, it, in the eyes of some of the people, some of the leaders who wanted immediate uh, African unity, such as Kwame Nkrumah, Mudibo Keita, Ahmed Benbella, the OAU was a watered-down organization. But let us be kind to ourselves. At that time, the OAE was very clear that we wanted to ensure that we liberate African countries which were still under the colonial yoke and those which were under apartheid and the regime of Ian Smith in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. To that extent, in the struggle to liberate African countries from political slavery, the OAU did play its part. When the OAU in the year 1999, culminating in its founding in the 2001-2002, it transitioned into the African Union, a number of things ought to have been done. Perhaps the reason why we think that we have not done very well is because we could have done better. And there is no doubt that we should have done better. And Therefore, it is important to say that having realized that we could have done better, what can we do in order to ensure that we up the ante? When in the year 2013, the African Union came up with Africa Agenda 2063, it was actually an apology to people like Kwame Nkrumah who had faith in African unity and a rededication that going forward, we were going to ensure that we move with greater speed towards economic integration, towards uh, ensuring that we were capable of uh, financing our activities. And, and I think we are moving in that direction. If you look at Africa Agenda 2063, it is now 10 years since the year 2013. We could have done better. But remember that we now have the Africa continental free trade area. What I want to see is greater trade. And in order to have greater trade, there are things that we must do. We must, in the nature of things, eliminate all tariff and non-tariff barriers, ensure that our skies are free, ensure that we eliminate conflict. Because if there is conflict, then it's not going to be possible to move. So the conflict, such as we see in different uh, parts of Africa, of different intensities, some formal, some informal, the ongoing fratricidal conflict in southern Cameroons or Ambazonia, we must find a way of eliminating all of them. The ongoing conflict in Sudan now must be eliminated. The conflicts that we see in Central African Republic, in Eastern Congo, and I have, in fact, as I'm talking to you, drafted a letter to the chair of the OAU, or, or both the chair of the commission and the oh. chair of the, of, of, of the AU, saying that there should be an extraordinary meeting of yeah. the African Union with only one agenda to resolve all the ongoing conflicts. Because you must also remember that these erstwhile colonizers and these latter-day neo-colonizers also want Africa to continue to be a theater of conflict because yes. conflict is a multi-billion dollar industry. And as long as there is conflict, they can take away our minerals. As long as there is conflict, they can sell us guns. As long as there is conflict, they can sell us 
armaments, as long as there is conflict, they can continue to control Africa. As long as there is conflict, they can continue to divide us. So I look forward to an emergency meeting of the African Union heads of states and government with a single agenda item. So one of the things that we were wrapping our minds around is what role the African Union has going forward in the context of Pan-Africanism and African unity. Yeah. There, is, uh, th there are those who think that the whole idea of African unity and Pan-Africanism is, 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 is just romantic and uh, sentimental and that those who talk about it are naive. But that is an improper understanding of what we mean by Pan-Africanism. Those of us who are votaries of Pan-Africanism proceed from the premise that first we've got to recognize as a people whether we are Africans in the continent or Africans in the diaspora, that Africa in her diversity is unique. And her uniqueness provides her with an opportunity to grow politically, economically, technologically, and otherwise. And when we talk about enhanced unity, we are talking about talking about our ability to trade, our ability to interact, our ability to use our resources to improve the quality of the lives of the people, our ability to administer our territories in a manner that is alive to African realities without being manipulated from outside. And we hold the view that if we trade intimately, if we work closely, if we allow African peoples to move across the continent, if we allow the African airspace to be free, and if we do all these things, then recognizing that it is an intergenerational task, ultimately, I have no doubt that as sure as a ripe mango falls from the tree, even politically, will begin to work closely. And that is the kind of vision that we have. Those who want to judge Africa within a period of 60 years are missing the point. This is an intergenerational affair. And let me tell you, we are going to continue. And if we don't succeed, our children, we will. And if our children don't, our children's children will do it. Wow. Wow.